Okay, Stephanie, I think uh, you should have mouse control and I'll let you take it away. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak to everyone today, and I'm happy to uh, share NRECA's experience thus far in um, the development of the Monarch Butterfly CCAA and why we see value for our members in participating. So let me jump right in. Okay, so today my goal is to share with you a few facts and figures uh, about electric cooperatives for those not as familiar with the unique role that they play in the U.S. utility sector. And I'll also cover NRECA's motivation for getting involved in the development of the CCAA and some examples of what our members are already doing today to create uh, pollinator habitat. And finally, I want to touch on a specific component of the CCAA, which is consortiums that we are particularly interested in and why it presents a unique way to increase uh, participation in the CCAA, I think especially with our membership. So let me give you some background on electric cooperatives. So um, for those not familiar with co-ops, let me quickly go through sort of some of the differences between them and um, investor-owned utilities or other independent power producers in the utility sector. So uh, co-ops are private, independent, not-for-profit electric utility businesses. They were established to provide at-cost electric service to their customers. Um, if we think back to the 1930s when much of rural America still went uh, without electricity, Co-ops were formed at this time by their communities to, to bring that power that they needed um, to, to them. And so co-ops are owned by their customers who, who we will refer to as consumers, consumer members, or member owners. Um, and that's because the consumers own the co-ops. Uh, they're owned by the consumers at the end of the line. They're also locally governed. They're governed uh, by their boards. Uh, that uh, um, constitute from the members elected to serve on them. They're democratically run, and uh, some co-ops are rate regulated by their state public utility commissions, while others are regulated by their boards in terms of setting rates. And so we tend to have a big focus on the importance of local decision making. And given that they're not-for-profit, co-ops also return any excess revenue to their consumer members in the form of capital credits. They also traditionally have a very strong focus on their communities and are involved in solutions uh, to benefit the lives of their members. Um, they exist to meet their member needs and not maximize profits. And, and one example today where they're very active is now in uh, rural broadband. And we have several that are responding to the need um, of bringing broadband uh, to rural America to meet the needs of their consumers. So ultimately, their focus is on delivering affordable, reliable power to consumers at the end of the line. And so what's our footprint? Um, how many co-ops are there? We have about 900 members across the country. They serve one in eight U.S. residents. And historically, co-ops, as I mentioned, were serving rural areas. But in more recent years, uh, the trend is, is moving increasingly to them also serving um, some of the newer suburban or exurban population centers, if you think about um, areas outside of Washington, D.C., outside of Atlanta that were more um, rural and less populated previously, these areas are now growing, and many of those are served by co-ops. So our 900 members include both distribution co-ops and generation and transmission co-ops. Uh, distribution co-ops are the direct point of line with their consumer members in the delivery of electricity and other services, and, and these are the ones serving the customer at the end of the line. The generation and transmission cooperatives, or G&Ts, as we will refer to them, uh, provide wholesale power to distribution co-ops uh, through their own uh, generation and by purchasing power on behalf of their distribution members. So let me go into a little more detail on that. Uh, we have, as you can see on this map, we've got um, more than 831 distribution co-ops across the country. You can see the, their service territories here. 
Uh, we just added a few more at our board meeting in June, and that's why I don't have the precise number, but I know that we did, we are now in 48 states because we added a member in Rhode Island. Uh, in total, we serve 42 million uh, people across the country, and um, and in terms of today's topic, uh, co-ops own and maintain 2.6 million miles, or 42% of the nation's distribution lines across the country. So you can see there's a huge potential uh, for our members to contribute monarch habitat in the context of the CCAA. So who are the customers of these distribution co-ops? Uh, typically, they're serving areas with low population density. Though, as I mentioned, some co-ops are in faster-growing population centers uh, in more recent years. But overall, co-ops are serving an average of about eight consumers per mile of line and collect annual revenue of about $19,135 per mile of line. If you compare this to the rest of the industry, including both investor-owned utilities and municipal utilities, they average about 32 consumers per mile of line and nearly 80,000 in revenue per mile. And so co-ops are still, you know, delivering that same reliable power that all utilities are 24-7, but we're doing it with while taking in a lot less revenue. So we always keep that in mind. And we also know that uh, co-ops are serving 93% of the persistent poverty counties in the U.S. And so we are sensitive to the impacts of additional or new costs being added because, again, these costs are directly borne by those end-of-the-line consumers. And this map shows our uh, G&T members, where they're located across the country. Again, they are serving the power needs of their distribution co-op members. There are 62 G&Ts across the U.S., they are owned by the distribution members they serve, and I'll come back to that when I talk about consortiums later on. Uh, Co-ops generate nearly 5% of the, the total electricity produced in the U.S. And so um, now that you have a sense of who our members are, let me talk about NRECA's interest in getting involved in the CCAA. So NRECA joined the advisory team back in uh, 2018 and we participated throughout the development of the CCAA and we did this for a few reasons. Uh, the monarch butterfly range overlaps uh, with nearly all of our members given that it's across 49 states and so an ESA listing of the monarch could have a widespread impact on the co-ops uh, we wanted to support a voluntary conservation approach that could give regulatory certainty and operational flexibility uh, for the co-ops and, and make a, um, participation in the agreement um, as attractive as possible. And we think it can do that in terms of how it streamlines uh, processes to address monarch habitat and we think will ultimately lower the cost of, of adding habitat for the monarch for co-ops. We also wanted to make sure co-ops have a voice in this process because, as I just described, there's some unique aspects um, to co-ops that we wanted to make sure were represented up front as the agreement come to get, came together. And I think ultimately will yield greater participation in the agreement, which is something we all want. We want to see more habitat for the monarch, and and so we are happy to do that. We also think that this, um, the timing of the CCAA, you know, it helps. Um, it's a unique opportunity to help preclude potentially the listing of the monarch butterfly. And we also know that our co-ops are already creating pollinator habitat, and we don't want them to be penalized if they're creating habitat today and then um, a listing occurs down the road. So we think the CCAA can go a long way toward addressing that potential issue. And I'll give you a few examples now. So first, I want to highlight Dairyland Power Cooperative. They're headquartered in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They have been very active, and they've already um, established nearly 300 acres of pollinator habitat at solar farms, substations, and on a capped coal ash landfill, which is actually where they began this journey back in 1994 in capping um, a coal ash landfill with, instead of the 
the typical road seed mix, they use a native prairie mix, working with prairie restorations to do that, and developing a 10-year management plan uh, for that site. And in more recent years, the focus has been on solar projects. Dairyland has an agreement with CMS Energy and NG to purchase 25 megawatts of energy from 18 different solar projects throughout their throughout Dairyland's uh, service territory. So working with Prairie Restorations again, uh, you know they've been working on establishing specific seed mixes for these sites and managing them, and and that's resulted in about 250 new acres of pollinator habitat at their solar sites. And now they're they're looking at establishing habitat at various uh, substations sites on their system. So let me also highlight with Dairyland another example. Uh, they previously enrolled 110 acres of bluffland property into a conservation easement uh, with the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. And that included this area of about seven and a half acres of bluff prairie, which as you can see is very steep, tough terrain uh, to manage. And working with the conservancy and volunteers, uh, they worked on nuisance species removal and using um, controlled burns with the idea here being of stimulating dormant seed beds um, present on the site and, and did not involve any new planting, but just you know making sure that all of the ecological diversity that's already there you know can can be uh, utilized. And finally, I want to highlight with them, you know, they Darian certainly recognizes the the value and importance of public outreach as a part of their success with their pollinator work. And so they they've um, gone they've taken efforts to give out seed packets to the public involving local groups and school groups and their outreach. They have a week-long education display at their headquarters throughout Pollinator Week in which they have some handouts to staff. And so they've really um, taken advantage of that side of things as well. Another member I'd like to highlight is East Kentucky Power Cooperative. They're headquartered in Winchester, uh, Kentucky. They're another great example of a member getting involved with Monarch Habitat and also utilizing the positive public relations uh, benefits that can come with that. So in 2017, um, East Kentucky uh, established a 1.8 1 1 acre Monarch waste station adjacent to their new cooperative solar farm one generating facility. And that site includes native pollinator habitat, native wildlife habitat, and monarch habitat. And um, it includes a solar farm viewing station that provides some great opportunities for environmental outreach. You can see here their pollinator condo that they established. So this is something that they they built um, using various products from their facilities throughout the co-op, including old um, insulators, tools, and work boots from from the co-op. And it can hold uh, host uh, native pollinators for nesting, and really provides a great opportunity for for outreach when they bring in the public to take a look. And this year, um, they're expanding their Monarch waste stations at their headquarters, as well as their bluegrass and spurlock generating stations. Overall, they're going to transition uh, 10 acres of fescue to Monarch habitat. So third, I want to highlight uh, Wolverine Power Cooperative. They are uh, headquartered in Cadillac, Michigan. They uh, have been very active for a, a while now in cultivating pollinator habitat along their rights of way um, across their 1600 mile transmission network using minimal mowing, removing undesirable trees and shrubs, and spot applications of herbicide. So a big focus has been uh, sowing pollinator friendly seed mixes during construction restoration activities. And this photo shows the response uh, to native prairie seed planting after construction uh, after just one year. Um, and in this next so, uh, photo, we see the response after two years. And so you can see it really is starting to turn into beautiful rights of way and, and that the work really pays off um, in the long run for pollinators. And so now they have plans to in be incorporating milkweed as well for, for monarchs. So 
Next, I want to highlight Connexus Energy. They are a distribution cooperative and are also, I believe, an advisory team member on the CCAA. Um, they're Minnesota's largest distribution co-op, um, and they maintain about 55 acres of pollinator habitat, uh, with the first being planted back in 2014. Um, they consider pollinator habitat to really be the new normal and in, in including these plots um, in all of their solar facilities in Minnesota. And, and they connect, you know, every year with hundreds of their members to tour these sites. And they've even featured the first solar facility that also included a bee uh, apiary. And finally, I want to highlight uh, Craighead Electric Cooperative, headquartered in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So they are now uh, getting in on the pollinator habitat game as well uh, with their new uh, Solar One project, which is, is a one megawatt solar facility. They're also going to be uh, providing sustainable habitat to pollinators and other wildlife in the region. They worked with Northeast Arkansas chapter of the of Quail Forever to to establish this program, uh, working with volunteers earlier this March, you can see um, sowing the site with native grasses, wildflowers, and other plants that will benefit quail, pollinators, and other wildlife. So I wanted to highlight some of those member examples where they're already doing some of these things today. Um, and now let me just talk about one aspect of the CCAA that we think presents a unique value proposition for our members and which we were um, active and working on as the agreement came together. So, and that would be consortiums. Um, so you all may be familiar that as part of the agreement, uh, the CCAA allows consortiums of applicants to apply together. And essentially you are submitting one application that encompasses all partners uh, that want to participate in that consortium to the programmatic administrator, which is the University of Illinois Chicago. And, and ultimately what you're doing there is the primary applicant still has some type of, um, has some relationship with the subsidiary applicants. They ensure that um, all the, the primary application encompasses the total enrolled lands and adopted acres to account for collectively all of the subsidiary applicants. And then all of the tracking and monitoring still remains the same um, across the partners, but they're working together to implement that. And so who is likely to implement this consortium option? Well, we think that cooperatives are um, great candidates for using this option. And I know of several that are are looking at it through this lens and looking to apply to the CCAA uh, using this approach. And in general, with respect to our members, we think that the most likely scenario for a consortium would be that G&T co-op applying with any of their interested uh, distribution co-op member systems. If you remember, I, I talked about uh, the distribution co-ops uh, own the G&T that they work with, and so that's, that relationship pre-exists there. Uh, but this is just one example. We also have statewide organizations of our co-ops. We could see them also applying on behalf of their members and, and working um, together to implement the CCAA. So I'll get into more of the why on the next slide, but I just want to mention also that we, I think we've talked as the CCAA come to came together that other examples could be DOTs working together, whether it's a state DOT working with any affiliated local or county road authorities that want to do that um, could be an option depending on their circumstances. Another arrangement could be some other uh, energy corporation with subsidiary companies and they could manage the arrangement in that way as well. So, Overall, we see the advantages of consortiums being, um, and, and let me say I'm answering this from the perspective of cooperatives specifically. Um, first, sharing the cost of that administrative fee can result in significant savings uh, to our members when it's spread across all the participants of a, of a consortium. And I'll talk a uh, about a specific example on the next two slides. 
But again, you know, cost is an important factor for co-ops. Any additional costs are borne directly by that end-of-the-line consumer. And so we think taking this approach can help make the CCAA um, more palatable for many smaller co-ops that might otherwise be discouraged. And we also think that working with a partner is much more ideal than going it alone on this agreement. Um, again, many of these distribution co-ops are very small. Some of them have, you know, seven full-time staff. And so there's not really extra bandwidth there to necessarily take on um, new initiatives like this unless they really, you know, get creative. And so this idea of forming a consortium instead of fully going it alone, I think is really desirable in that sense. Um, similarly, with respect to resource constraints, you know, that can play a role in making these consortiums more ad advantageous from our members' perspective. We don't want these various constraints, whether it be financial or staff time, this idea that they need to be out there tracking something new, or even feeling like, you know, we haven't been doing this before, we don't have the expertise. We don't want these constraints to be barriers um, from, from them taking part in the CCAA, and so we think the consortiums can help with that. And finally, you know, we think that partners that work as part of consortiums can learn from each other and build on the successes uh, going forward by sharing lessons learned amongst each other. For those co-ops that haven't created pollinator habitat before, you know, if they go in on a consortium and partner with co-ops that have some experience, like the ones I mentioned as an example, um, they'll be much better off when it comes to getting started. And so. Let me just illustrate a couple things on what I, I was talking about with respect to the fee. So these are some hypothetical uh, uh, co-ops based on just um, looking in terms of a GNT, a typical size or average size, a distribution co-op. And you can see that what their fees would be on the left for the GNT that uh, with this system applying to the CCAA, um, the distribution co-op um, applying on their own in the middle, and then if they formed a consortium with just the two of them together. And you see that uh, by forming that consortium, the fee is only slightly higher than if the GNT had simply applied on their own. And but but doing that, you know, you have additional partners coming into the fold, and um, so we have more habitat being established on the ground, and we can incent that smaller distribution co-op from shouldering the burden alone, whether it be cost or staff time. Um, and in the second example, we continue to see, so this is now showing that same GNT and forming a consortium with five distribution co-ops of the same size, so definitely hypothetical, but we can see that, again, you know, their their fee is only a little bit higher uh, than if that GNT had gone it, gone it alone. But now we've got six participants participating instead of one. Um, this is, you know, primarily driven by the fact that the distribution costs mostly only are including distribution acreage. Um, but it really, you know, can help to bring more partners into the fold and establish more habitat. So, Hopefully, for all of these reasons, you know, including the cost share, um, this is a reason why we advocated for this consortium option, and, and we see some of our members being interested in pursuing this route for the CCIA. So I just want to wrap up by highlighting, you know, we've tried to um, highlight our efforts as much as possible to our members to make sure they understand uh, the implications of a potential monarch listing um, and also how the CCAA can help um, um, meet that challenge. And so we've tried to use some innovative tools to raise the profile of this issue. And you see there, there's um, we have our RE magazine that goes to, out to our members. We did a feature article this spring. We did an episode of our monthly podcast featuring this issue. And we also just did a webinar um, to, to highlight the agreement. And so now our challenge is to keep this issue front and center. Um, but we're working on that. And I will just say thank you for your time today. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie.